take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never... Okay, we're ready to get started. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the National Postal Museum and the press preview for our new exhibition called Baseball America's Home Run. Uh, thank you for joining us. To those of you that are joining on the Zoom conference, we will uh, have this press preview recorded and posted on our, our press page. So uh, if you go to our main website, which is postalmuseum.si.edu and click press, you will find all the information on the exhibition. You'll also have an opportunity to view and download a whole bunch of really great, stunning photographs of the exhibition that you can use in your, in your uh, media outlets. So uh, I want to introduce first our director, Elliot Gruber, is the director of the National Postal Museum, and I know he's excited. This has been a long time coming for us. So welcome, Elliot. Thank you very much, and, and good morning, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to be, have, have you all here t t this morning. The National Postal Museum was founded in 1993 and is one of 18 Smithsonian museums, including also the National Zoo. We have more than 6 million items in our collection, the second most of any Smithsonian museum, and our collection includes printing presses, trucks, uniforms, archival material, and of course, we also house the National Philatelic Collection. And that includes plate, prop, plate blocks, proofs, dies, original artwork, and of course, stamps. Stamps are really a gateway into our country, into who we are. They reflect what we are as a nation and what we deem important as a country, what we choose to celebrate, as well as what we choose to commemorate. As such, the National Postal Museum is a history museum that can tell just about any story in American history. And given that our, we have a large holding of international stamps, we can tell many stories around the world. I am very proud now to introduce Dan Piazza, head curator of the Postal Museum, head curator of Baseball America's Home Run. As you will see, Dan has done a masterful job in producing an educational, enjoyable, and academically rigorous examination of baseball's history and its connections to philately and postal history. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you uh, very much, Elliot, for that kind introduction, and welcome to all of you joining us on site and online for the uh, for the preview of this exhibition. Uh, you know, I've been curating and promoting exhibitions at the National Postal Museum for many years now, and my favorite question is always when people ask me, "Well, why is the National Postal Museum doing an exhibition about that?" Um, I love getting that reaction because it lets me know that we're exploring a familiar topic in a way that hasn't been attempted before, that we're connecting our content areas of postage stamps and the mail to larger themes in ways that our visitors don't expect. And especially so with this exhibition, there have been literally thousands of baseball exhibitions, big ones and small ones, traveling shows, permanent galleries all over the country. Surely there is nothing new left to say about the history of baseball, right? That was a significant concern for me in developing this show, finding something fresh to say about the topic. So why is the National Postal Museum doing an exhibit about baseball? In one sense, the answer lies in the importance of place. The building that we're meeting in now and where you're watching us online, the old city post office in Washington, D.C., was built in 1914 on the site of one of Washington, D.C.'s earliest ball fields a National League field called Capitol Grounds existed on this site from 1886 until 1890. It held, according to newspaper reports at the time, 6,500 fans who watched Major League Baseball games in the shadow of the Capitol Dome. Cornelius McGillicuddy, better known as Connie Mack, made his Major League debut here on this site in 1886 and later went on to become the legendary manager of the Philadelphia Athletics for 50 years from 1901 until 1950. So this place 
occupies its own significant niche in baseball history. But the answer lies also in the museum's collection. More than 60 US postage stamps commemorate baseball's playing fields, players, and great moments. Taking these stamps as our departure point, we shed new light on the history of the game in the 20th century. Most visitors, I think, will be surprised to learn that the earliest baseball-themed postage stamps in the world were not issued by the United States, but by other countries like the Philippines, Nicaragua, Colombia, Panama. The U.S. issued its first baseball stamp in 1939. Called the Centennial of Baseball Issue, it was a project of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his postmaster general, James Farley, who was also an inveterate Yankees fan to commemorate the 100th anniversary of an event that never took place, the invention of baseball by Abner Doubleday at Cooperstown, New York. But the stamp sold millions of copies, lending a sort of federal seal of approval to a mythological story that helped propagate that myth for generations. The multiple stories behind these earliest baseball stamps are told in this exhibition. And prior to the electronic age, the mail was a key way that baseball fans interacted with the sport. They wrote fan letters to their favorite players. They wrote long letters to each other describing baseball games they had played in or watched. They wrote angry letters to team owners and league officials protesting decisions they didn't like. In the wake of the 1919 White Sox gambling scandal, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis was hired as the first baseball commissioner to restore the public's faith in the game. But what really saved the sport was Babe Ruth in his 1920 debut with the New York Yankees, ushering in the era of power hitting and home run kings. In the exhibition, we have a bat that Ruth wielded in, this, in that important baseball season, courtesy of Smithsonian author and private collector Stephen Wong, whom you'll hear from in a few minutes. But then inexplicably, almost arbitrarily, Judge Landis suspended Babe Ruth from baseball in 1921, citing him for running afoul of a rarely enforced prohibition against playing exhibition games in the off season. The public was outraged and a selection of angry letters mailed, were mailed to Landis demanding Ruth's reinstatement. They're featured in the exhibition. We also have other more hopeful letters addressed to Landis in December 1943, when it briefly looked as though he was poised to integrate the sport racially. Fans urged him to honor African Americans' military service in World War II by allowing them to finally play in America's national game. But Landis chose to bunt instead, and baseball's color line remained in place for nearly four more years. During both world wars, military play spread baseball around the world. Hundreds of major league players served in the US armed forces, many of them entertaining and raising morale among the troops by playing the game. We have long letters from service members overseas describing fantasy baseball leagues played in the Pacific theater or relating how they watched future Hall of Famers, Specialist First Class Johnny Mize and Staff Sergeant Joe DiMaggio play baseball on a post in Hawaii in September 1944. But troops were not the only government employees to wear baseball uniforms. By 1890, black players had been excluded from professional baseball by mutual agreement among the white team owners. African Americans and Latino Americans instead found playing opportunities in the various Negro Leagues, as well as in Mexico, Cuba, and the Caribbean. But these leagues couldn't pay their players as well as the major leagues, and many Negro Leaguers needed to take day jobs to make ends meet. The Post Office Department was the largest civilian employer of African Americans during the Negro League era, and so more than a few players were also postal employees. This exhibit highlights the career, for example, of Ed Bolden, who was manager of the Hilldale Athletic Club, um, an important uh, Negro League team from the Philadelphia area. He was an organizer with Andrew Rube Foster of the 1924 Colored World Series, and for 40 years, he was a postal clerk in Philadelphia's central post office. Major League Baseball finally integrated in 1947, and next week is the 75th anniversary of Jackie Robinson breaking baseball's color line at Ebbets Field. 
We're pleased to be showing a game-worn jersey belonging to Robinson alongside other memorabilia of that groundbreaking opening day in Flatbush, Brooklyn. Robinson later became the first baseball player honored with his own postage stamp, a 1982 issue in the long-running Black Heritage Stamp series, and the original artwork for that stamp by noted illustrator Jerry Pinckney is on display featuring him in a jersey very much like the one that Stephen is loaning to us. Lastly, the exhibit explores the many commonalities between stamp and baseball collecting. For more than a century now, baseball cards, postage stamps, and postcards have taken inspiration from and self-consciously mimicked each other's forms. Baseball stamps, like the legendary playing fields issue of 2001, have been based directly on period postcards, while baseball card publishers in the early 20th century printed some of their cards as regulation-sized postcards designed to be sent through the mail. These are coveted both by stamp and baseball memorabilia collectors alike. The Legends of Baseball stamp series issued in 2000 takes its design cues, its color palette, its player poses, and other design elements from the bubblegum cards of the 1930s and 40s, while baseball, baseball card publishers such as Topps and Fleer have issued cards in the form of postage stamps, with, complete with perforations and accompanying collecting albums. So regardless of whether their passion is stamps or baseball cards, all collectors speak the language of condition, rarity, and provenance, which are themes that are also woven throughout this exhibition. Okay, I cannot mention everything in the show, no matter how much I'd like to, so I will stop there and just acknowledge that I'm leaving out a lot of great material and stories that one just has to visit the virtual exhibition online or come to the gallery in order to see them. I'll just add a few notes. Uh, that the visually rich and incredibly rare material in this show comes first and foremost from our own permanent collection. The National Postal Museum has, as Director Gruber mentioned uh, earlier, the second largest collection at the Smithsonian Institution. And we drew heavily from our own holdings of stamps and mail, as well as the collections of other Smithsonian units such as the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the National Air and Space Museum, and the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. The original artwork for US postage stamps and the incredibly rare proof material and press sheets on display are from the amazing Postmaster General's collection of the United States Postal Service. The baseball letters in the exhibition that are not from our own collection have been lent to us by the Library of Congress Manuscripts Division and the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum in Cooperstown. The Hall of Fame, Boston Red Sox, and Chicago Cubs lent many stadium artifacts and have been wonderful collaborators with us in both the research and presentation of this exhibition. There's also an interesting companion exhibit of fake baseball memorabilia, all of it seized from the mail by law enforcement officers with the United States Postal Inspection Service and the FBI. An interesting cautionary tale for collectors, no matter what they collect, of, uh, of the uh, propagation of fakes and forgeries and how the Postal Inspection Service works to remove them from the mail stream. A number of private collectors have also shared their treasured pieces with us to help us put the postal artifacts in a larger context. These loans will attract a much broader audience to the show and while they are here, we hope those visitors will then have the opportunity to learn a lot about postage stamps and postal history. I'm very pleased that we have one of those private collectors here with us this morning. Stephen Wong from Hong Kong, China has an enormous personal collection of game-worn and game-used baseball uniforms and equipment. He's collaborated with the Smithsonian Institution in various capacities for nearly 20 years, and now most recently is a technical advisor on baseball history uh, and a major lender to this new exhibition. So I'd like now to invite Stephen Wong up to say a few words to you. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you very much, Elliot, Marty, and the entire Smithsonian National Postal Museum staff for literally spending about over four years pulling this uh, landmark exhibition together. Um, I, I'm very humbled, to be honest, to, to be at this podium, not only because of having the privilege of working with Elliot, Dan, Emery, 
<clears throat> Marshall and their team, but most importantly, uh, because of my 20-year uh, partnership with the Smithsonian Institution. Back in 2003, uh, when I was literally, um, you know, uh, left Hong Kong uh, because of the SARS epidemic, which is kind of indicative of what we're going through right now with COVID, um, there was, I left my job and moved to Santa Barbara to put a proposal together for my very first book that I wanted to write to share um, my passion and uh, knowledge about um, memorabilia that commemorates baseball history. And uh, obviously there's, there are many wonderful things in museums and public institutions, <clears throat> but people did not understand the magnitude of material that existed in private collections. And so uh, as a sort of with my resume in hand and absolutely no credentials as an author, I went to the Book Expo of America in Los Angeles and pitched my idea to about 12 publishing houses. And uh, lo and behold, um, by fate and destiny, the Smithsonian uh, Books had signed me to my very first project and my very first book, which got published in 2005 called Smithsonian Baseball. The journey with uh, the Smithsonian Institution um, uh, has, has culminated into a total of three books, and um, the pinnacle of all that is obviously this exhibition. Uh, it has been an extraordinary journey with the Smithsonian, that, to which I'm deeply grateful to the institution. I'm deeply grateful to Elliot, to Dan, to Marshall, and the entire uh, Postal Museum staff to be able to put on an exhibition, which frankly, uh, is is very similar to how us collectors in the baseball world think about things. Uh, I'm what you call sort of a universal collector, and we love to collect things, um, bats, uniforms, display pieces, photographs, cards, all sorts of memorabilia that embellish or commemorate a player or an event uh, in baseball history. And uh, so when um, a case of splendid serendipity in March of 2018, when Elliot and Dan happened to be in Hong Kong, uh, Carolyn Gleason, who was my project director for all three of my books, at, uh, she works at Smithsonian Books, had told me that Elliot and Dan, the, uh, the, cur the uh, uh, director and the curator of the Postal Museum, were coming to Hong Kong for a stamp show, and you need to meet them. And that's how it all started. Uh, when, we, when we went out to dinner, I brought them to my home to see some of the artifacts. And when they told me about how um, the museum had an incredible collection of the original artwork to make the stamps, let alone the actual stamps, and they wanted to sort of put flesh and bone to those stamps, meaning that a stamp of Roberto Clemente, how could we uh, uh, embellish uh, the beauty and the aura of that particular stamp and more importantly of obviously of the player in the case Roberto Clemente, Jackie Robinson, uh, Yogi Berra, Roy Campanella and many of the other players that are featured on stamps and celebrated. And so uh, unifying those that artwork with the stamps along with the game used bats, uh, the uniforms, display pieces, cards, uh, uh, as well as the stadium relics uh, to commemorate uh, the series of stamps that the um, Postal Service has issued over the course of many, many years to commemorate, you know, the, the parks of Fenway Park, uh, Scheib Park, Crosley Field, Forbes Field, on Ebbets Field, Yankee Stadium, on and on, to actually be able to see the artwork, the stamps, but then an actual object from that stadium or an object from Jackie Robinson or Roberto Clemente would bring this exhibition to life. And that's what we have tried to do with Baseball America's Home Run, and hopefully uh, all of you will enjoy it. And again, it's been a tremendous privilege to, to work with the Postal Museum over literally four years to put this together, and I really hope the uh, public enjoys it. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Elliot and Dan and Stephen, and 
listen, if you, if you have questions, if you would like to arrange a time to come visit us here at the, at the National Postal Museum and tour Baseball America's Home Run, I'd love to hear from you. I'm Marty Emery. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications. And my contact information is on our press page on our website. And again, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Bye. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crackers, Jack. I don't care if I never get back.